Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Ultimate General Civil War. Uh, we are returning to a live stream that I conducted, oh, um, well by this point it probably has been about a week or so ago. And in our last episode we looked at the Battle of Shiloh, more or less the Confederate defeat at the Battle of Shiloh. Things didn't go well, to say the least. In this video, we're kind of in the in-between. We're into the Gaines Mill campaign, the Peninsula campaign, but we have three minor battles we need to play through first. This video will not cover Gaines Mill. It'll cover some of those minor engagements which take place prior to the Battle of Gaines Mill, as well as my attempt to rebuild the Confederate Army from its uh, disastrous defeat at the hands of General Grant at the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, the main reason that we lost so disastrously? Well, the fact that our supplies were captured by the enemy, and we ran out of bullets, and as a result, ended up trying to fight a medieval uh, style of combat without any actual uh, firearms. I mean, we still had them, but it was basically charge, 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 and hope to break the Union lines, and that didn't work. This video will be a little bit different, however. This video is not going to really talk about the gameplay that you're going to see in front of you. Instead, I'm going to be doing a book review. I've done a few of these, a few book reviews in the past, uh, but this one was particularly well suited to this kind of a video because it's actually about a book that talks about the American Civil War. So with that being said, uh, again, I'm not going to be using the live stream audio in this case. I'm going to provide my own, and I hope you guys sit back and enjoy the uh, review. And uh, if you do decide you want the book or you're interested in the book or it sounds interesting to you and you'd like to read it, I will post a link in the description of the video, uh, which will bring you to the affiliate link. So basically, if you go to Amazon.com and you buy that book or or if you go to Amazon.com through that link and then go anywhere else in Amazon and buy something there, I'll get a small cut. Uh, that's more or less in the interest of full disclosure. I have no real vested interest in reviewing this book positively. Uh, I don't get paid to review it. I, you know, I, I listen to a lot of books on Audible. This book looked interesting. I picked it up and played it, but I figure if I'm going to be talking about it, why not, you know, uh, try to stick it to the man a little bit. And uh, if anyone does buy anything from this book or through this link, you know, I'll get a little bit and it's easier than asking you guys for things like donations and stuff. Because again, I really just do this because I enjoy it, but there's no reason to miss out on things. Uh, if it's an opportunity, but that's enough about that. Uh, so what's the book I'm talking about here today? So the book that I'll actually be talking about in this video is called Defeating Lee, A History of the Second Corps of the Army of the Potomac. It's written by Lawrence Kreiser, Jr. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It was published in 2011, and it was published by the Indiana University Press. So I believe this was kind of, I don't know if it was a uh, dissertation topic, but it was definitely, you know, an academic-focused book. At a high level, uh, the author of this book is uh, providing a unit history of the Second Corps in the Army of the Potomac. The Second Corps was made famous, uh, most, most famous, from its repulse of Pickett's charge at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, there's the historic uh, image and, and quote from General Winfield Scott Hancock, the commander of the Corps at the time, uh, riding back and forth on his horse uh, while under heavy Confederate artillery bombardment shortly before the charge really gets underway when uh, the Confederates are bombarding, kind of prepping up the Union lines with artillery. And one of his aides comes up to him and says, General, you need to get down from your horse. I'm paraphrasing a little bit there. Uh, and Hancock kind of pulls his horse away from the aide and then is quoted as saying, there are times when a Corps commander's life does not count. This uh, scene is sort of immortalized in uh, the Killer Angels uh, adaptation of the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, in which uh, the the Union commander, it's kind of a pinnacle moment in the in the movie as uh, General Chamberlain, or not General, but Colonel Chamberlain watches on in awe of this true leader, uh, you know, inspiring his troops by action. Uh, that's sort of the high watermark, if you will, in terms of popular memory of the Second Corps. Uh, Hancock had also been credited with, you know, allowing the Union to reform on Cemetery Hill. He was given a lot of credit for the Battle of Gettysburg in general, where after General Reynolds is wounded, or actually, sorry, killed early on the first day of the battle, Meade sends Hancock as sort of his right, you know, his right arm, as lieutenant to take charge of the field, uh, and he helps to rally the Union forces uh, that are routed earlier in the day uh, and ensure that the Union make a stand on Cemetery Hill. There's some 
There's some dispute over Hancock's role versus Howard's role, the uh, senior Union commander present. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it was sort of the battle was Hancock was one of the heroes of Gettysburg and the Second Corps was one of the heroic units of the Battle of Gettysburg. But the Second Corps is well regarded outside of the Battle of Gettysburg. It wasn't some one-time moment uh, in in history where this corps perfor- performed well. The Second Corps is one of the iconic units of the Union Army. It's one of the few corps that was founded at the beginning of the corps system and survived all the way through. There were originally four corps, and that's what this book touches on. Originally, there were four Union Corps, the first, second, third, and fourth, uh, that were formed, and the second corps survived the entire war. The fourth and the, or sorry, the first and the third corps, actually the first, third, and fourth corps, were all at some point in time during the war disbanded or became dysfunctional because of losses and whatnot. The second survived the entire war, the only of the original corps to do so, and that's where Chrysler really uh, focuses his history on. Is his his argument is that. There have been numerous histories written about specific units in the Civil War. Uh, most of those histories, however, have been focused at the regimental level, some at the brigade level for you know units like the Irish Brigade. Um, he doesn't really address the division level. I'm not sure if there are really any divisional histories, but you certainly have plenty of brigade histories looking at the Iron Brigade, the Stonewall Brigade, uh, the Irish Brigade, and then you have a plethora of regimental histories, which makes the most sense, uh, given that most of these kind of histories are based off of individual you know, soldiers writing letters and things like that, and the regiment is the basic building block of any soldier's experience in the war, so it would make sense to focus on that. But Chrysler argues that uh, the core level history, there have only been a handful of core histories, uh, seven or eight, I believe, in the Union Army, uh, and many of them are from long ago. There hasn't been much done recently. And so he says he's going to go ahead and provide a history of the Second Corps. And he does this uh, pretty well. Uh, he talks about the founding of the Corps system, how there was actually some politics behind it, which I found fascinating. Apparently, President Lincoln uh, ordered the Corps system into existence despite the objections of General McClellan. There was some hope from Republicans that uh, the Corps system would help minimize General McClellan's uh, control over the Army. Uh, It didn't quite work out that way. Many of the Corps commanders ended up becoming loyalists of McClellan, but nonetheless, that was sort of this perception of minimizing McClellan's own control over the army. Uh, The book talks a little bit about uh, General Sumner, the first commander of the Corps, uh, and then talks about the original organizational structure of the Corps, kind of namely talking about how uh, the Corps system as it was originally uh, envisioned involved a brigade of cavalry from every Corps, uh, three divisions of infantry, and a artillery reserve for the Corps. Uh, It made the argument that the support unit's inclusion in the Corps structure was faulty. Uh, The Confederates concentrated their cavalry in an independent cavalry corps, whereas the Union parceled it out to the corps. The idea was that every corps would have its own sort of eyes and ears and its own cavalry so it could operate independently from the rest of the army. That's sort of the idea. A corps, at its essence, is a the largest organizational body shy of an army, and the idea is it's supposed to be a mini-army. It's supposed to encapsulate everything that it would need to fight on its own. It would have its own artillery, its own cavalry, its own infantry. It could go off and be its own army on its own. Um, Lee used Jackson's force that way during the Second Manassas Campaign, uh, and the Union uh, occasionally would use similar uh, tactics with the Valley uh, campaigns. But the idea is based off of Napoleon's uh, concept of the Corps, which was developed during the Napoleonic Wars 50 years before. The actual execution left a little bit to be desired, at least in the Union Army, because the Union didn't have sufficient cavalry to play a decisive role in the battle, and that meant most of the time when the Confederates were meeting Union cavalry, the Confederates would get the better of them because the Confederates concentrated their cavalry and the Union did not. Uh, Similarly with the artillery, there was sufficient artillery to provide infantry support on defensive operations, but very rarely did the Union have the ability to concentrate sufficient guns to blast a hole in an enemy line during an offensive because the cavalry was kind of parceled out to individual units as part of a corps. It almost reminds me of the way that people talk about uh, the use of armor in the French military uh, during World War II, 
when the criticism was that the artil- or the armor was used as an infantry support weapon rather than a weapon in of itself to decide the fate of the battle. And, Ky- and Kaiser kind of goes off and talks about sort of the initial uh, organization, the initial uh, core commanders that existed throughout the Union Army, and then kind of narrows in uh, for the rest of the book, mainly on his focus of the second core in the Army of the Potomac. The book attempts to analyze the Corps' history and performance throughout the war. Uh, It talks initially about the Peninsula Campaign. It moves on to uh, the Second Manassas Campaign and moves into Antietam, all under General Sumner's uh, purview or or supervision, if you will. Uh, It makes the claim that the Second Corps and Sumner specifically, his finest moment, occurred at the Battle of Seven Pines, which we've actually talked about in a previous video where we played Civil War Generals too. That being a Confederate attack by General Joseph E. Johnston against an isolated force of Union troops, some 30,000 Union troops cut off on the other side of a flooded river. The only Union Corps commander to exercise his initiative and judgment, General Sumner decided we're going to race across this bridge, across this river, and provide support to the Union troops that are under attack and are being driven back splendidly by the Confederacy. His engineers protested, said their bridges wouldn't hold, the river was too flooded, but at the end of the day it did hold, and the Second Corps ended up saving uh, the remnants, I think it was Heinzelman's Fourth Corps, but I could be wrong, at the Battle of Second or of Seven Pines, and then fought the Confederacy to a standstill. Uh, but the interesting thing about these early war engagements is it almost feels like Chrysler kind of talks about the initial organization of the Corps, talks about some of the politics between Lincoln and McClellan, but he really ignores the initial Peninsula campaign. Uh, Seven Pines is mentioned in passing maybe the span of a page. Uh, There's a couple of diary entries where soldiers kind of talk about their thoughts of the battle. And then the Seven Days likewise passes in a mere couple of pages. Uh, It's not a comprehensive battlefield history of the Second Corps during this campaign. Uh, It may be a comprehensive explanation of the Corps, its role, uh, and uh, its organization, but it certainly seems to skimp a little bit on the details uh, for the actual fighting. And that seems to be a trend that carries on throughout the book. It's not to say that Chrysler doesn't talk about the battles. He does. In fact, he does a splendid job of detailing the fighting around Petersburg, in my opinion, where he does delve quite a few pages and quite a bit of detail into the Second Corps' Corps, uh, fight there. Uh, Gettysburg is probably adequately covered, but for a battle that really kind of made the Corps' reputation as being, you know, the preeminent Union Corps, you would think it would provide a little bit more detail. But all in all, the battle experiences of the Corps seem to be uh, shortened a bit. What the book really devolves into is giving a brief one-page explanation of what happened in a given battle, and then a couple of pages of, you know, here's what the soldiers had to say about this at the individual level. And that's fine, I think, if you're talking about, like, a regimental history, but when you're getting into a core history, it's so intertwined with the Union Army of the Potomac, I think Chrysler spends a little bit too much time assuming that his audience knows what's going on. It really assumes the uh, audience understands the Peninsula campaign and what was going on there. Otherwise, it's just way too brief. It doesn't provide any real explanation. Uh, He kind of assumes that the audience understands what's going on during the Antietam campaign, during the Gettysburg campaign, during the Chancellorsville battle. Uh, You know, the Second Corps wasn't heavily engaged at Chancellorsville in the early parts of the fight, and yet he barely mentions the flanking assault by Jackson. I think the book would have been better served if Chrysler was to give a little bit more background, uh, because while I know, you know, quite a bit about the war, and while this book certainly isn't, its audience is much more in tuned with sort of the academic side of things, uh, I think it would have behooved him uh, to provide a little bit more detail and context to the uninitiated. Um... With that being said, the diary entries that he uses to talk about these conflicts uh, are very striking and very uh, very useful. Uh, I think they're very interesting. Uh, the political background that he talks about, uh, where different commanders are arguing, especially during the initial forming of the of the core system, I had no idea it was some great big political game where you know Little Mac was making the argument that. Uh, he was opposed to the core system, at least initially, because uh, there was no way to know who was ready for core command and who wasn't. You needed more battlefield success or battlefield failure to really evaluate some of these generals. And he was worried by elevating people to core command, if they were to fail, there was one, there was nowhere to hide them in the army because they'd be superior in rank to most of their uh, otherwise, you know, equal 
ranked division commanders. You couldn't exactly demote them back down to division command. You couldn't hide them in an unimportant position. You couldn't shuffle them off to Washington. They were too highly ranked at that point. Uh, so he was he, he thought it was precipitous. While Irvin McDowell disagreed and said the Union Army at uh, Bull Run, uh, the, the Union commander of the Army at Bull Run, uh, said that a core system was vital and that you know you could operate where you'd have a wide advance with multiple cores advancing and each one just barely in range of the other to provide support to the other uh, in, in a time of need. So I had no idea there was this whole political dialogue in the background where, you know, Lincoln ends up coming in and just writing basically an executive order to saying you will adopt a core command. I, I, that was interesting. Um, but the book doesn't go into enough detail about the fighting, uh, in my opinion. I think it also could have used a little bit more background on some of the commanders involved. It provided a little bit of a background on Sumner, but it kind of seemed rushed. Uh, it provided pretty minimal background on Hancock, although it certainly talked about him a lot because he was in command of the Second Corps for so long. That's Winfield Scott Hancock, who ended up taking command of the Second Corps shortly before uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, it doesn't really delve much into the later war commanders who take over from Hancock, so as the war goes on, uh, the book details sort of the declining fighting power of the Second Corps. I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, but I didn't even know kind of what the Corps went through, how it had suffered a disproportionate heavy amount of casualties. Grant really relied strongly on the Second Corps. He consolidated after Gettysburg when Grant came east. Grant and Meade consolidated the number of corps. And there's a lot of political infighting. I thought it was interesting how the book talks about, you know, some of the uh, up, the frustrations with some of the everyday soldiers when certain brigades or regiments were consolidated and, and that kind of hurt unit cohesion. Uh, the Overland Campaign, the book does a very good job. Not so much of the fighting. Again, it kind of skimps out on the fighting. But what it does a good job of is it really communicates the identity of the soldiers to the Second Corps, which initially the book kind of says, hey, people didn't really think in terms of corps, but by the time the war got further along, you know, the Second Corps had had such a positive reputation that soldiers really started identifying with it uh, and uh, thinking of themselves as soldiers of the Second Corps. Uh, but what, what's interesting about that is that as the war goes on, it kind of describes the Corps' disintegration. So, you know, the Corps built up an early history, an early legacy uh, in the early Peninsula Campaign. It kind of was left out of Second Manassas on somewhat controversial grounds, where Sumner kind of stayed back and didn't advance to support the Army, uh, claiming he didn't receive orders to do so. And then it's uh, bloodletting at Antietam, which uh, Sumner led uh, its lead division into an ambush that cost more than 2,000 lives, but the Corps ended up breaking the Confederate center at Antietam. And then the ever so bloody and, and equally, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, but the, the scene in Gods and Generals of the Second Corps Hancock's division charging up the slopes at Mary's Heights at Fredericksburg. So it builds up this reputation of this hard-fighting, valiant, honorable Corps, and then it all kind of comes to a head at the Battle of Gettysburg, where it helps extricate and save the Third Corps, and then it repulses the iconic Pickett's Charge. Uh, but what the book does a good job of doing, uh, while it's a little bit short in some of those other battles that I just mentioned, is really describing how the Corps starts to fall apart, starts to lose its cohesion, late in the war. If you know a little bit about Civil War history, you know that the Union Army suffered a couple of embarrassing performances in front of Petersburg during that famous siege at the end of the Civil War when General Grant had advanced over a 40-day-plus period. He had fought the Battle of the Wilderness, swung around Lee's flank, fought the Battle of Spotsylvania, swung around Lee's flank again, fought the Battle of North Anna, uh, then on to Cold Harbor, and eventually outflanked Lee to the point where he was attacking Petersburg, which was a critical rail junction to the south of Richmond. This is toward the end of the war. This is, you know, Grant and Meade are in command of the Union Army of the Potomac, Grant in command of all forces, Meade still remaining uh, sort of local control of the Army of the Potomac. And this was this incredibly bloody campaign, which the fighting is kind of not really ignored, but not really expanded upon in this book. But what you start to get through all these diary entries and historical musings of different individuals is this core starts to fall apart. Its cohesion starts to fall apart. Its morale starts to fall apart. Massive influxes of new troops are required. Massive casualties are suffered. Troops stop signing up for various reasons. And you see this once proud Army Corps really kind of not completely falling apart as a, as a fighting unit, but certainly only a shadow of its former self 
into the Petersburg campaign. And then again into the uh, eventual final campaign, the Appomattox campaign, which saw the surrender of Lee's army. Overall, it's a good surface history of the Second Corps and the Union Army of the Potomac. Uh, it tells a interesting story about the uh, initial uh, creation of the core system. It talks a little bit about the evolution of the politics within the core. Interestingly enough, the Second Corps uh, was more of a democratic core, so the uh, soldiers in it uh, tended to side more with the Democrat Party as opposed to the Republicans. Uh, therefore, initially, they had a somewhat interestingly kind of indifferent attitude to the Emancipation Proclamation, but then as the war went on and, and they were suffering some struggles, they became to be they began to become frustrated. You know, they signed up to preserve the Union. They didn't sign up to serve uh, and, uh, you know, free the, the slaves. Uh, but then in the experiences in Petersburg, where they began to see substantial uh, commitments and sacrifices made by black soldiers, they were impressed and, and became respectful of those soldiers, although never quite granting them equality. It's an interesting look. Again, it looks at kind of the political perception of the troops. It doesn't really delve at all into some of the figures in the core in in the book it doesn't talk enough about the division commanders about the brigade commanders it really becomes almost like many regimental histories built in uh, where they reference a core identity and that's my main complaint i know i'm being a little bit harsh of it i do think it's a worthwhile read I do think it's a worthwhile buy. I enjoyed it. The narrator on Audible did a good job with it. I didn't buy the paper copy. I, I got the Audible copy. Uh, it's a reasonable listen. It's only like 12 or 13 hours. I would have preferred this book to be double the length and really talk more about the experiences at the battles, maybe bring in some more quotes from generals or division commanders and not just kind of talking at the private level uh, and, and kind of tell some narratives around some of the other key figures outside of just Hancock, outside of just Sumner. Talk about some of the other key figures uh, within the Army. Talk about the struggle that led Darius Couch, the commander of the Second Corps, uh, when Hooker uh, took over to end up you know, asking for reassignment, which, which brought about the uh, rise of, of Hancock. Um, you know, talk about a few of these other things in more detail because, again, it's it's a bit too cursory at times where it's, you know, everything is, is just kind of cruising along and, and you don't necessarily fully understand why things happen the way that they happen. And it's more of a this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Oh, here's a couple diary entries. Um, that sounds maybe a little bit unfairly harsh because it is, as I said, still an interesting book and an interesting read. But I didn't quite get out of the book what I had hoped. Uh, but again, what I will say is that if you're interested in core histories, which I am, I would love to see more histories that focus on specific contingents of the Army of the Potomac beyond just the regimental level. Because at least what I'm looking for is not so much a personalized history of this specific infantryman and what their experience was or the the common infantryman. I'm interested in kind of a deep dive into the entire experience. So yes, the common infantryman plays a role in that, but we shouldn't ignore the senior commanders either. And, and this book does a good job in places of talking about some real big personality conflicts between, you know, for example, John, uh, Winfield Scott Hancock and uh, was it John Gibbon or Edward Gibbon, the, one of the division commanders in the Second Corps. They get in a spat, and the book kind of talks about it. I want to see a little bit more of that. I want to see a little bit more of the politics, a little bit more of the, you know, Lincoln did this and McClellan was upset, and, and as a result, you know, th this is what happened to the core structure. I want to see a little bit more of that. I just wanted a little bit more depth than I got out of the book. Uh, but but nonetheless, despite that complaint, the book does a very good job of explaining, um, you know, what the Second Corps did at a high level, explaining some of the experiences that the soldiers of the Second Corps uh, went through in order to, you know, help fight and preserve the Union, uh, and does a, a decent job of kind of uh, showing the evolution of, of some of the politics and some of the different uh, figures and characters uh, throughout uh, the conflict. So it's a good read. It's a good book. It's not a Pulitzer winner. It's not, you know, my favorite book of all time, but nonetheless, it is still uh, a worthwhile uh, look at the Second Corps. And there aren't enough of them. There need to be more core histories. We focus, I think, too much at the regimental level. And I think there's opportunity uh, to focus at uh, a, a deeper level of the, uh, of the Civil War. Um, with that being said, guys, that'll conclude the review uh, portion of this video. You can see here we're in the midst of fighting the Battle of Winchester uh, on this map here from our live stream. Uh, things aren't going great. Uh, we're trying to push the enemy back, but they're staunchly located in some 
woods around here as we uh, attempt to outflank them. We're doing well on the south, but in the north, things do not look like they're going well. But here's a secret, folks. This is not the only Battle of Winchester that I'm going to fight. Oh, I know, right? Things aren't going great. Well, obviously, we've got about 20 minutes left to try and, or 20 game minutes left to try and try and take uh, the enemy and defeat them. But between you and me, I uh, game the system a little bit. I say, listen, I'm not doing as well as I'd like. This is a stream where I have to be successful. I can't lose uh, too many battles because if I do, I'll be fired and the series will be over. And we already saw that happen once where I was commanding a Union force. And so I make the decision not to fight to win every single battle, but I do make the kind of game decision here in this one specific battle. I'm going to refight this. Uh, because, again, I'm giving a little bit away in the way of spoilers, but you can see up north that things, as as you can see my cavalry charging down some skirmishers. Uh, but in general, things aren't going well in the north. In the south, uh, we're doing okay tolerably, but you know certainly room for improvement. And more importantly, our core is being shredded to pieces. We are losing a lot of casualties uh, and not really gaining much in this fight. So this is actually going to be the first of two battles of Winchester, which you witness. Basically, what will happen is after this one, I'll reload a save, and then you can see me fight again, or at least that's what my memory says I did. Um, maybe I didn't, uh, but that's I'm pretty sure that's what I end up doing. Um, I guess we'll find out in a couple of minutes. Anyway, guys, uh, that's going to do it for this video uh, book review. As I said, the link to the book that I just talked about, uh, The History of the Second Corps, uh, will be in the description. Uh, that's just above the comment section, just below the video. And if you're interested, just go ahead, click on that link, uh, and I'll get a little bit of money if you buy it. If you buy anything else on Amazon in that same session, by the way, I'll get a little bit as well. Again, more so in the interest of full disclosure. This isn't a job. This isn't a living. Uh, it's just nice to be... Uh, to get a little bit extra, given the fact that, you know, there's certainly a lot of time and, and uh, effort goes into uh, some of the topics I talk about on this channel. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed the the book review. Let me know if you want to hear more of these. I've done quite a few book reviews in the past, not a lot recently. Um, but again, I, I didn't want to make it too stale because I've got this, this live stream series is going to end up being about 20 parts long. And I didn't want to just make it 20 straight parts and there you, there you see the defeat i didn't want to just make it 20 parts of me uh, kind of just cutting up a live stream that occurred i wanted to try and mix things up a little bit as we get further into the series and as the game has been out longer and people are going to be browsing these videos maybe trying to get a little bit more than just uh what happens in the battles uh that's why i'm looking at, at fighting it this way Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I'm going to go ahead and jump off now. So, again, you'll see the Battle of Winchester again. Sorry. Uh, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump off now. And I hope you guys all enjoyed the video, the stream. Let me know your thoughts. Please don't hesitate to leave uh, some comments in the description below. And uh, thanks again for tuning in. Okay, guys, uh, so I will leave with my customary uh, salutation, and I, this is just uh, me rambling. Wow, I'm really rambling here. Uh, so with that being said, uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful night, wonderful day, and this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.